Switching gears, though, it's been quite a wild ride. For Bitcoin in 2024, we're not even halfway through the year yet. We just barely made it out of Q1 here, and we're midway into Q2. So prices have been on a tear, as you've been seeing on this chart. Year-to-date, the, the largest cryptocurrency up 50% year-to-date, thanks to demand for spot Bitcoin exchange-traded funds, those ETFs, and that started trading in January. And of course, most recently, the once every four year having event that took place last Friday, keeping the supply of Bitcoin limited and maintaining the decentralized currency's storage of value. So now, where do crypto investors stand? And if you're not an investor, should you be? For more, I'm joined by Eric Edelman, or Rick Edelman, Rick Edelman, joining us here this morning. Great to see you, Rick. Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals founder and the author of The Truth About Crypto. All right, so a lot of us are learning once again the truth about the having and coming off of that major event in a year of what's been major event on top of major event with the ETFs that we had mentioned earlier ago. So now, what does the future hold? What is the prospectus now for Bitcoin for the rest of 2024? Good to be with you, Brad, as always. Uh, you know, the, the having drew a lot of attention to what's going on in the world of crypto. The, the having is a once every four year event, uh, affects only Bitcoin. That is the largest, oldest, most popular, best known coin. So it gets a lot of attention and people are excited about it and understandably so. But the, the having event in and of itself is just an ordinary element of how Bitcoin operates. So uh, history tells us that in the year following a having, Bitcoin's price has always risen dramatically. Now, we all know past performance doesn't guarantee the future, but it has always been dem demonstrated to be a bullish signal for crypto. So there's excitement for that reason. You cited the most important reason, though, for why there's excitement, and that is the launch of the new ETFs, the spot Bitcoin ETFs that debuted in January. That is the key reason why there's so much excitement about what's going on in the world of Bitcoin these days. So the halving is now behind us. Everyone's excited that it likely will generate higher prices over the next year. And the Bitcoin ETFs are in the market now, and that is generating massive new inflows for investors. And that is causing a price spike as well. So a lot of bullishness for the world of Bitcoin right now. What, what is the determining factor in whether or not someone should be considering crypto for their portfolio? Two key criteria, Brad. Number one, are you a long-term investor? And number two, do you own a diversified portfolio? Meaning if you are of the mind that you wanna own a little bit of everything, stocks, bonds, government securities, real estate, oil, gold, foreign assets, emerging markets, then Crypto belongs in that portfolio just like everything else. The whole point to a diversified portfolio is to reduce your risks. Don't have all your eggs in one basket. You want to diversify. So the more you diversify, the better off you're going to be from a risk perspective. In that context, adding Bitcoin to your portfolio, even though Bitcoin itself is risky, the science tells us that adding risky assets to the portfolio actually lowers the overall risk of the portfolio thanks to diversification. So if you are long term and diversified, you ought to have a little bit of Bitcoin in your asset allocation. And then additionally here, as, as we're thinking about some of the other ETFs that have also been filed for where there could be some significant kind of flow activity that takes place, Ethereum, and that's set to have its own kind of shining light over the course of this year too. Is what happened for Bitcoin that expected to be the same for Ethereum here? Very likely. Uh, there are a, a dozen or so applications in front of the SEC right now to allow for Ethereum ETFs. The general attitude is that the SEC will say no in May to those applications, but everybody is hopeful that the SEC will say yes by the end of the year or certainly in early of next year. Uh, Ethereum is the number two asset, and between Bitcoin and Ethereum, they have about 90% of the total market share of all of crypto out of tens of thousands of coins. Those two are really it. They're kind of like the Coke and Pepsi of crypto. So a lot of people are very excited that Ethereum is going to eventually have its own set of ETFs, and uh, there's a lot of bullish for that and for Ethereum and some other coins too. And on the regulatory front, if anyone is adding crypto to their portfolio, what most notably could move the dial one way or the other this year? 
Uh, we could see legislation possibly in the area of stable coins, and this would be the first crypto legislation ever, and it would demonstrate that Congress is recognizing that this is a new legitimate asset class. It is a new technological innovation that has legitimate place in corporate commerce, and uh, that's all very exciting. So watch for what Congress is doing. There are a couple of bills in the Senate right now that just might get advanced before the elections. The other thing is on the other side of that coin, the SEC continues to hate crypto. Gary Gensler, the chair of the SEC, is continuing his enforcement activities. He continues to file lawsuits against crypto companies, continues to believe no new regulation is necessary, continues to believe that there's no pro positive place for crypto in the American landscape. And so if you were to see uh, that kind of activity continue, that could be perceived as bad news for uh, crypto, at least here in the U.S. All right, Rick, just lastly, while we have you, it is Financial Literacy Month as well. And so we got to end with one key term that people need to know uh, from your radar and surrounding Bitcoin here. DeFi, decentralized finance. DeFi refers to the fact that crypto works as a direct link between two people, two parties, buyers and sellers, uh, creators and uh, receivers. And there's no intermediary. There's no third party in between you and me. And as a result, blockchains are able to operate faster and cheaper and safer 24 seven. Imagine you doing stock transactions without a broker in between you or getting a mortgage without having a mortgage company in between you. This is why DeFi, decentralized finance, is a term you need to become familiar with. Rick Edelman, Digital Assets Council of Financial Professionals founder. Thanks so much for taking the time here with us today, Rick. Good to see you. You too, Brad.